It looks like we have a quorum, so we'll continue on with the implementation session. Uh, Gino Gaziano will be talking about the response to invasive species. Um, he's a researcher with UAF. Yeah, I'm going to talk um, about the role of education um, in the response to invasive species. Um, I work with UAF and the Cooperative Extension Service. Um, one of our main roles is outreach and education. Um, we get funding from a variety of different sources to do that. Some of the projects I'm going to specifically talk about today were funded by APHIS, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and uh, um, the Department of Natural Resources. Um, we uh, deal with um, invasive plant management. Um, IPM actually um, means integrated pest management, and I'll explain what that is in a, in a bit for those that don't already know. And you can all hear me okay? Excellent. Okay. So first I want to give an overview of invasive species in Alaska. Uh, we've got a little bit of a taste of that earlier today. Um, the role of integrated pest management, because that's really the meat of how we deal with the ecosystem approach, is just what we, we call it, something we've been doing for a long time. Um, and then we'll talk about terrestrial invasive species education and delivery methods. So we're stepping away from the marine area and all that kind of stuff to um, get into my realm, which is more uh, terrestrial plants and terrestrial insect forest pests. So we'll talk about some education for identification and reporting, uh, prevention, uh, management, um, and then some of the gaps in education of particular groups and barriers to adopting those, those practices that we, that we preach. So this is well, probably our, one of our more successful invasive species um, as far as um, entering into the Arctic Circle, uh, white sweet clover. Um, it's a plant that um, really likes roadsides, and then where it ends up being a problem is on the uh, um, um, on glacial floodplains, um, where it can escape and uh, um, get you uh, um, start to diminish the, the ability of certain species of willows to uh, to recruit, um, as well as some other plants. Um, we do share data with the uh, um, with the Yukon and, and um, parts of the Northwest Territories, and um, uh, this data is actually from the Alaska Exotic Plant Information Clearinghouse, which you heard about earlier as well. So, um, invasive species in Alaska. Um, are um, have coming in at an increasing rate of introduction. So uh, back in 2006, there um, to 2008 or so, there was a 2007 actually there was a, a study about herbarium records and how many um, were coming in that are non-native versus native, and you know clearly shows that we have an increase in the, uh, um, the proportion of non-native species. Um, they adjusted for um, effort with this. This was done also by the Alaska Center for. Um, uh, eco or coastal, what was your guys' name again? They used to be the Heritage Program, so they changed names and it's always stumbling, yeah. Um, so some of the big um, issue species that we've been able to get on top of, though, we still have a lot of opportunities to keep things out, are um, species like Asian gypsy moth. We've had several interceptions at ports by Customs and Border Protection. Uh, we track for those on an annual basis. We've had a couple of interceptions um, in our traps, um, but nothing um, at a rate that would, would sound an alarm, which they ended up with that happening in Washington and Oregon last summer, and there's an eradication effort going on there. We've also had spotted knapweed introductions. We have five locations now. Um, every one of them is being managed. We used to have 22, and all but one of those um, infestations was managed by hand, um, as opposed to using herbicides. So, and one giant hogweed location in the state that we know of, um, down in the little town of Cake, Alaska. It's a, um, it's a village and it, um, in southeast Alaska, and we just happened on it at a presentation similar to this, only to, to non-professionals at the Alaska Forum on the Environment. So integrated pest management, this is you know, what's the, how we approach um, the, the ecosystem approach. Um, it's core to all forms of pest management. So like dealing with the mosquitoes last night. You, know, you either chose to deal with it and, and let them bite you, or you, you went in the bag and you got some spray and put it on you. Um, <laughs> what, the way it goes to the ecosystem approach, though, is that you really want to identify what your goals are for conservation in a particular area. So then you can actually take and identify species that would be an issue for that goal um, and discover, figure out how to manage them. But we start at prevention, as, as usual. We try to keep species from getting there in the first place because then you don't have to manage them. 
Follow that up with survey so you can see if your prevention measures are working. It's always good to have kind of an indicator species, one that's not necessarily as invasive as others, but it has many of the similar biological characteristics, so you can see if people are adopting those prevention measures. Then detection. So if we detect something, you've got to figure out what it is. You have to identify the species and the ecosystem characteristics, so that species biology, what it might do, what the ecosystem characteristics are. Hopefully you've already got a handle on that. Sometimes we don't. And then we develop a control prescription. You monitor and review that control plan, and then the circle repeats itself. We go back to prevention. This framework was developed by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, in order to minimize the impact of the environment from weed management, particularly in farms, in pest management in schools, and the whole myriad of things that might involve the use of pesticides. So looking to actually reduce the use of pesticides, but not rule them out of the toolbox. So for identification and reporting, we've developed a mobile application called Alaska Weeds ID. Right now it just does weeds. We're thinking in the future of adding some other things. You can download it on an iOS or Android device for free. We did that with funding from the Western Alaska Landscape Conservation Cooperative, as well as others, and worked with the University of Georgia and the Bugwood Group. We also have an online reporting system. We get old-fashioned emails, phone calls, specimen delivery, because Anchorage, or all cooperative extension service offices, have an open door to the public. We do online identification courses that I'll talk about in a minute that focus on early detection species, as well as prevention. And then collectively through this, with all our offices in the state, we receive thousands of queries and reports annually. Admittedly, most of them are, what is this weird thing growing in my lawn and how do I get rid of it? But every once in a while, sometimes at least once a year, we get that golden little thing where somebody brings in spotted knapweed and they think it's purple loosestrife. But still, they were aware, they got something out of it, and they brought it in. So some of the significant finds we've had in the state, all of which have been managed, some of which are eradicated. Purple loosestrife has been eradicated in Anchorage, other than the ones in people's gardens. There were a few holdouts when we did a replacement program. But garlic mustard, spotted knapweed, and giant hogweed that I mentioned, and then amber mark birch leaf miner was also one of those finds that was initially managed. It's still here, and it's out there. I think the biocontrol has kind of waned a bit. So I want to give you a quick tour of the mobile app. Hopefully you download it, give it a whirl on campus. You know, UAF, with our experiment stations, is one of the epicenters of some of Alaska's agricultural weed escapees. So, you know, give it a whirl as you're walking around. So we have report forms in this. We also have species lists, as well as a key, which is kind of the meat of this that was put together. And we're basically seeking to both educate people about invasive weeds, identification, management, and conversely, get reports from them. So this is what it looks like. We have categories of weeds, aquatics, grasses, et cetera. If you pick one of those and you're going through the key, the next question it's going to ask you is, what kind of leaf arrangement do you have? Everything's got pictures in there. And then it'll ask about leaf margins. Eventually it asks about, you know, what color of flower it is, et cetera. And you finally end up with a list of species. You can also enter in, at least with flowers, that they're not there. If you don't have leaves or flowers, we're probably not going to be able to identify it. So we'll move on if that happens. When you finally select a species, it comes to several pictures, three of them, usually three to four, that help you figure out, is that really what I see? We have some background information about the species, native species that look like those species. We have some really common invasive species that actually look like some less common native species. But it's kind of surprisingly so, and it always bugs me when people, you know, get information about bird vetch, and then the next thing I know they're pulling marsh peat, and I see it on a trail when I'm out biking or running. So we also give them a little bit of information about management. And at this point, they can actually do that report to us. They tap on the report button. And this information mirrors the minimum amount of information that needs to go into the Alaska Exotic Plant Information Clearinghouse. 
So we have a goal of being able to actually add data to the Alaska Exotic Plant Information Clearinghouse using this app. So they can take a picture. That's the first line of confirmation for us. Um, you know, we do workshops on how to take pictures of plants and insects. Um, that can be uh, probably the most difficult thing that you get blurry pictures. Um, and they um, then go through, select their species, um, but they also, your phone is geo-referenced as long as you allow it. And um, so they are able to determine where they're at with the phone. They can either draw a polygon or um, drop a point. Um, this works when you're outside of cell phone coverage or wireless coverage um, because your phone will do that even when it's in airplane mode. Um, or maybe it has to not be in airplane mode. But anyway, it works when you're outside of coverage. It stores it on the phone. When you get back to um, wireless or, or cell phone covered area, you can then upload your uh, information. It sends me an email, um, and I get it out to whoever is appropriate. Um, if, if I can't identify it or if it needs a response, um, et cetera. We have um, online detection education courses. This one is almost released. We're kind of starting down this path of these online courses. They're, um, they're asynchronous for the moment, which means you take it whenever you want to. We're targeting specific groups of people. So with forest pests, we're looking at arborists, we're looking at foresters, and we're looking at certified pesticide applicators and landscapers, because they come to us with a lot of questions anyway. They're already engaged in these things, and we can provide them continuing education <coughs> units for taking these courses for their certificate, whether whatever certificate that is. So the first round of these deals with um, Federal, um, federally managed uh, or regulated uh, forest pests. Um, APHIS gave us the funding to do this. And um, we have four modules. Each module has a quiz associated with it that you gotta get at least 80% on. Um, the quizzes rotate through questions because you can take the quiz as many times as you want, but we don't want them always getting the same question. Um, and then there's a final test too. So after you take all four, you do that. And then um, it alerts me, I correct the final test, and we send you a certificate that you're able to provide to whatever certification um, organization that is, the Society of American Foresters, or um, the International Arborists, et cetera. Um, so these are some of the images we use when we talk about identification. These are several moths, um, defoliators that we annually um, trap for, um, us and or the Division of Agriculture or, or um, uh, Division of Forestry. And uh, we also have videos that we pulled from various locations um, there's a lot of other um, um, agencies and, and extension services in the country that are doing these first detector programs, and that's kind of what we're billing this as, is help us be a first detector of this. So then we can get them onto our Facebook page um, and, and try to keep them engaged that way too, so that they're, um, so they're looking for things at the right time of year. So we have a basic idea of some of the flight times of this or when things might come, and so we can alert people that have taken our courses or on our Facebook page or on listservs that we're, we're using to, uh, to do this. Um, prevention education, the first one we tackled was funded through the Division of Agriculture. Um, we're focusing on prevention through best management practices for management of roads and rights of way, so vegetation management. Um, one of the big things we do with that is trying to get people to use weed-free forage, straw, and gravel, which some agencies require. Some don't. The Kenai Refuge requires um, any of those things for use um, on, on refuge lands whenever um, the oil and gas industry is doing work out there. Um, the Iditarod now purchases weed free um, gravel uh, or straw, rather, for the, uh, all the, the dogs that they have. And um, um, this is also an online course. So there's our good friend Sweet Clover up there on the lower left um, infesting a gravel pit that was up on the Dalton Highway, the Hall Road, you know, Ice Road truckers. Um, etc. And uh, um, weed free forage or straw is marked with this purple and yellow twine. So it's, it's, if it doesn't have purple and yellow twine, it's not weed certified weed free. So this thing walks them through um, what that means, as well as um, nine other uh, best management practices um, that they have. We have a similar format um, four units, quizzes, final test, and they get um, certification points. Had a little bit of issues with people doing this because while we have two agencies in two specific situations that are requiring this stuff, they're not also saying like, hey, take this. Um, uh, Department of Transportation has tried requiring some things like weed-free gravel, weed-free forage and straw, but the people they're requiring enough don't understand it. And they're like, oh yeah, we'll get it. 
And then they don't understand the certification project process and um, end up being able to pop out of it right at the end. So we're trying to get over some of those issues, um, but it's going to take a while. So again, we have videos um, that show people how to clean equipment. Um, give them background on, on how to, like why you clean equipment, where you clean equipment, um, some of the best practices for cleaning equipment, et cetera. So um, management's included in our online courses um, wherever it's applicable. Um, we often have kind of timely webinars um, that, that we do that are, or face-to-face -face workshops. Um, we had one uh, last week on spruce bark beetle, which is a native forest pest, and we're planning on doing a webinar on that uh, because spruce bark beetle seems to be on the rise. Um, with our, our multiple El Ninos that we had back to back. Um, we also have many flyers, materials for the public, and um, if people can call us and get site-specific prescriptions um, for uh, dealing with invasive weeds or forest pests or um, other pests that we're, we're funded to deal with. Um, so we did a recent survey dealing with early detection and rapid response, which is find the plant early and respond to it rapidly. Um, the Division of Forestry did a, um, a similar one for um, insects. Um, we did the one for, for plants. And so we have some information about um, gaps in education and why people aren't, aren't participating, et cetera. Um, the group that we um, surveyed was actually professionals or people who happened to be on our listserv, so they were kind of first-time buy-ins and uh, um, or likely buy-ins. And uh, it seemed like a good group to start with. We also had just a month to complete this project, so um, kind of went at it pretty fast. So we asked people um, who responded to the survey, it was about 300 people that we surveyed, and we had about 50 respondents, um, what kind of groups they served with early deception and rapid response training. Um, the general public came out on top and garden clubs, because that's a really easy thing for people to grasp onto. Um, uh, the landscapers, arborists, and certified pesticide applicators, that's kind of a niche market that we handle. Um, so we think we're doing pretty good there, but, uh, um, um, but the rest of the, the group isn't necessarily pushing that with them. Um, the Western Arctic, Southeast Alaska, and um, um, you know, Northern Arctic, um, so Western Alaska, or Arctic and Southeast Alaska are really underserved groups. Southeast Alaska is the most surprising and alarming one because they have just as many weeds as the rest of the state, and they have a really significant um, a presence of the Tungus National Forest. I think that's turning around. They've had um, some changes in their their botanists in their programs, and it seems like they are, are really getting up there. So people who didn't participate identified lack of trainings as a main reason, um, lack of support from superiors, general lack of interest, or they're just generally in rural areas. Um, they don't have any staff that's focused on this project. So um, barriers to adopting these management practices. So these weren't necessarily asked for in the, uh, um, in, in the survey, but people had uh, uh, made comments about it. State regulations are really out of date. Um, we've added two species since they first made the uh, um, invasive weed, invasive, uh, weed law. Um, lack of funding, um, of course, and then a hesitance to use all the tools, in particular herbicides. Um, there's been a general hesitance in Alaska. Um, there are some agencies that have really started to move forward with that, and I believe that they're doing a pretty good job of, of doing it with those principles of integrated pest management. Um, so our solution, we need to make our trainings more accessible. Um, you know, online asynchronous is our current effort. We need to identify the reasons um, uh, for non-participation in rural areas, the non-connected areas of the state, um, as far as the road goes, um, and then really start to push it with those groups, um, and maybe even get out to those groups face-to-face -face if we need to. Um, um, identify some funding sources. That's always been a struggle, and continue to educate agencies and the public. Um, the Committee for Noxious and Invasive Plant Management is a multi-agency group. Um, they also have non-NGOs and uh, um, um, the general public are involved in that group. We have an annual conference every year that you saw the Save the Date card for, so if you want to come back to Alaska, end of October, we'll be having that. Um, and uh, um, we are um, writing a letter to DNR to push them to update the regulations. Several years ago, I think it's been about seven years ago, they were um, told by the legislature to update their regulations, hire a weed um, an invasive agricultural pest coordinator. and um, it went through the process, and then it kind of just disappeared. So um, we don't need it. Well, you can talk to me offline about the reasons. So, uh, but we're, we're trying to push them again. There's a new director, um, new governor, and uh, the current Invasive Reason Agricultural Pest Coordinator is obviously supportive as well. So thanks, and we have time for questions.